Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Julie Leach, Senior Manager Campaigns and Communications at the Atmospheric Fund. You can call us TAP. Thanks so much for joining the webinar this morning where we'll be discussing the latest carbon emissions inventory for the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. And we'll be discussing what's next for municipalities to reach net zero in the region. First, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which our team is gathering virtually, referred to by settlers as the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Indigenous people have lived here for thousands of years, including the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Erie, Neutral, Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. This land is governed by the Dish With One Spoon Covenant, a treaty which bound these groups in sharing this territory and protecting the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. I am lucky to be joined today by my TAC colleagues, Ekaterina Tsakova, Director of Research Innovation, and Brian Purcell, Vice President of Policy and Programs. We also have members of our research and innovation team and policy team to support our question and answer period. Miriam Shikarsford, Pat Ronan, and Evan Wiseman. A couple notes on housekeeping. We're gonna hold live questions until after the presentations, but in the meantime, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, your name and your organization, where you're coming from. Um, no solicitation, please. You can also ask your questions anytime using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we got some really great discussion questions in the Zoom registration, so we'll start with those after the presentations. And now I will turn it over to Ekaterina Sakova. Thanks very much, Julie, and uh, welcome everybody. It's great uh, to see so many people joining and so many people continue to join. Let's get started. Next slide, please. Now, um, TAFR started doing this inventory in 2015 um, to really determine the main sources of emissions across the region um, and equally important uh, to communicate that information. Um, so we really use our inventory to not only help shape our focus as an organization, and the projects that we do, the types of grants, the investments that we make, um, but we also communicate that and we hope that it's useful for you and your organizations and your work. And we're here to continue the, the discussion, not only throughout the webinar, but afterwards as well. So if you have any questions or if you have um, any other points of discussions you want to continue beyond this one hour today, please uh, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Next slide. Oh, um, actually, we'll stay on the slide. In, um, in 2021, the GTHA emitted a little over 51.2 million tons of carbon in the atmosphere, and that represents a 4.5% increase from 2020. We saw increases in every sector and in every region. And you can see the spread on the slide here across the GTHA. And these values are not adjusted for population. Now, there's a bit of an upside here. We honestly expected a bigger bounce back um, from pre-pandemic levels. And that largely didn't happen uh, because transportation emission reductions were sustained. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few slides. Next slide, please. Now, the majority of um, emission reduction progress really focused in that 2005 to 2015 period, the coal phase out, and notwithstanding the blip that you see during the 2020 pandemic, we haven't had much progress in reducing emissions since 2015. And um, the 4.5% increase we saw in 2021 is in direct contrast with the approximately 8% decrease uh, per year that we need uh, to reach those 2030 targets. And so what this highlights is that we're really running out of time. The more that we continue to delay reductions, the harder and really the more expensive it's going to be to make up that gap. And we need to sustain that increase despite the sustained growth in population that we're going to continue to see um, in the region. So that's very important to note. Next slide, please. This is a bit of a close up of what the picture looks like over the last few years. You can see quite clearly here that we are uh, below 2019, percent, uh, 2019 uh, emissions, but we are slowly inching towards them. 
And for the first time this year, we're including fugitive methane emissions uh, in orange. You see the orange bar graphs and, um, there, and, and those impacts. Um, and depending on the year, that translates to about 10 to 15% uh, increase in total emissions. Now, a bit of an aside on fugitive methane, um, that includes leaks from extraction, fracking, um, loss throughout the pipeline and distribution network. So all those upstream effects, which are part of the full life cycle of natural gas. Most inventories typically don't include that because it's part of scope three, but we really wanted to analyze it um, uh, because the, uh, looking at the numbers, it really challenges this idea that natural gas can be used as a bridging fuel. Um, and in fact, if you include fugitive methane in natural gas emissions, those rise about a third. So it's quite important and quite significant. And my colleague, uh, Pat, will put a link um, to our latest uh, fugitive methane report, which dives into a little bit more of the details of how we came up uh, with the numbers and the calculations to determine fugitive methane. And we'll have that in the chat available for you shortly. Next slide, please. Now, sector emissions, let's dive a little bit deeper into the different sectors across the GTHA. Emission profiles here stayed similar to previous years. Building sector, specifically natural gas used for space heating and uh, hot water is still the top source of emissions across the region. That's followed by transportation uh, and the use of gasoline and diesel. Um, and uh, by the way, those sectors also saw some of the biggest increases, almost 0.8 million tons for buildings and about 0.3 million tons for transportation. And um, uh, the rest of the remaining missions are, are made up of industry waste and agriculture. And a quick note on agriculture here, um, important to note that the majority of food is not produced within the GTA chain. And so um, that's part of scope three, and that's not reflected in this inventory. So that's partly why that agriculture component is quite small. Next slide, please. Overall, buildings are continuing to dominate emissions. Uh, natural gas uh, emissions in buildings increased by about 1.7% despite warmer weather in 2021. And that increase was largely driven by the industrial sector, which rose about 16%. Now what's interesting is that residential building consumption decreased by 3% despite new buildings being built that year. Um, and in fact, construction in 2021 was at almost 20%, um, almost a fifth higher compared to the 20 year average. So in addition to that partial return to office, we're most likely starting to see the impacts of efficiency gains. Um, and that's something that we're going to continue to dive in a bit more in the future. Moving over to the natural gas generated electricity, um, what's quite staggering here is that emissions from um, um, that rose by about 28%. And that was largely driven by natural gas power generation. And what we're starting to see now is that the total um, um, electricity consumption is relatively constant year to year, but it's really that emission intensity of the grid and that increasing emission intensity that's driving the overall increase in emissions here. Next slide, please. This graph puts that 20% increase uh, of natural gas generated electricity in a little bit more context. Um, so we saw um, that increase translates to about uh, going from 1.8 million tons to about 2.3 million tons. And you can see that electricity emissions have now are rebounding closer to 2016 levels. And looking in the future, those emissions are expected to triple by 2013. Um, so the picture does not look very good. And uh, I really wanna stress this, it does not have to be this way. Um, TAF released uh, our latest report on, which looks at how we can meet this rising demand in electricity uh, and achieve a net zero grade by 2035 uh, in a reliable and affordable way. Um, we'll link that in the chat as well, but that's really the approach that we need to start taking here because emissions are forecasted to increase quite considerably. Next slide, please. Here is where I get to talk a little bit about uh, some of the good news. Uh, the pandemic related drop in transportation emissions is largely sustained in 2021. You see that we're a little bit above 2020, about 2.3%, um, but we're still quite a bit lower uh, compared to 2019 uh, as COVID restrictions were lifting last year. We may see a bit more of a recovery in 2022, uh, but how much we, we, we bounce back once again is, is really within our control. Um, and this trend, uh, this, this 
quite significant reduction, uh, I think really highlights the success of a flexible working um, and really the direct impacts that it can have on transportation emissions. Um, we are still seeing a shift towards uh, use of bigger vehicles and be bigger vehicles being present on the road. Um, so the, the, the focus on, on, on electric vehicles is something that we really need to, uh, to pay attention. And Brian will talk a bit more about that in the next few slides. Next slide, please. And rounding off the remaining three sectors, uh, industrial emissions in 2021 were fairly close to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and those emissions are largely driven by um, carbon intensive steel and cement manufacturing, which represent almost two thirds of the total emissions. Um, and the way that TAF estimates emissions here is based on the change in natural gas uh, consumption. We're going to update our industrial, those industrial emission numbers uh, once we see the 2021 ga uh, greenhouse gas reporting program. And that's something that we do quite often. Um, but here really in, in industrial emissions, um, the, the steel production really represents quite a large portion and as well a large portion of Hamilton's emission profile. And cement production is primarily focused in German Peel region. So those are reflected in those municipalities. Waste emissions changed a little less than 1% from 2020. And they're estimated based on popula population growth. Um, we're assuming per capita emissions remain the same as 2020. And here, um, while gas, uh, um, landfill gas management is quite important, I'm making sure we capture methane. Really the biggest impact, uh, biggest way to prevent is really waste prevention. And agriculture emissions, um, similar to the waste, they changed less than 1% in 2020. Um, and what's driving emissions here really is the use of fertilizer um, and the nitrous oxide that is being released. Next slide, please. Now we'll look at uh, uh, regional emissions, uh, um, the carbon emissions through the regional lens. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about um, a few highlights from each of the municipalities, but please um, visit our website, which has quite a bit more information um, on the details and um, on, on uh, uh, some of the innovative highlights that are happening across the region. So overall, as I mentioned earlier um, in the talk, uh, um, all municipalities saw an increase in their emissions, um, but that increase varied from about 1.3% to 15%. And City of Toronto saw the lowest uh, increase at 1.3%. Um, Durham region, um, in Durham region now, industrial emissions for the first time are the largest source of emissions, uh, followed closely by transportation and buildings. So that's definitely gonna be a focus going forward. In Halton, um, uh, natural gas consumption in the industrial sector really drove the increase, uh, um, the quite drastic increase in emissions. In Hamilton, uh, the industrial sector, um, of course, represents really the biggest piece of the pie uh, because of steel production, followed by buildings. Um, what's interesting about Hamilton is that it's the only region in the GTHA that saw a decrease in transportation related emissions. Peel, um, a really big focus on buildings and transportations because those make up almost three quarters of uh, Peel's total emission profile. And uh, City of Toronto, as I mentioned, saw the lowest uh, increases across the region. Uh, buildings are still sitting at just a little over 60% of total emissions. And um, if all uh, planned and active construction is going to be completed, um, the total dwellings in the City of Toronto will increase by about a third. So buildings will be even more important of a sector going into the future. And just a note about the, that 1% increase in, in, in Toronto, um, I think that really highlights the importance of, of public policy um, and really the um, effects of strong green development standards and something that Brian will talk a bit more about that in a few moments. And uh, York, um, they're the highest, um, uh, York has um, quite high transportation uh, emissions uh, in the region uh, representing over half. So that's going to be a big focus point for York going forward. Next slide, please. Now here we've um, shown emissions, the spread of emissions across the, the region normalized by population. You can see that city of Hamilton is the highest because of steel production. And um, you know, of course, not only city of Hamilton benefits from that, it's the GTHA as a region and beyond. Um, and uh, you know, there, there's quite a bit of focus in that industry and plans to decarbonize that sector.
Andrum region there um, also includes um, a lot of the agricultural emissions uh, in the region um, represented um, in, in the emissions profile. Now, on the right hand side, you see the, um, uh, the, the, the emissions per capita, the tons per capita are averaged across the region and by year. And while the per capita averages have a small increase between 2020 and 2021, it's still quite a bit lower than 2019 levels, which is, which is good news. And here through this uh, um, normalized population lens, we see that an increase in emissions is partly because of population increases. But I really, really like to stress that just because population increases in the GTHA and is gonna continue to increase over the next few decades, we really don't get uh, a free pass here. We need to be reducing emissions despite the population that is gonna be coming into the region. And now I'll pass my talk uh, on to Brian, who's going to discuss a little bit more about the focus and, and the things that we need to look at to really start seeing our turnaround um, in emissions in the, uh, instead of going from increasing, going very much into decreasing. And Brian, I'll pass the baton off to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about climate action priorities that come from reviewing this data and the situation on emissions across the region. Um, and so as you've seen, emissions are rising uh, rapidly towards pre-pandemic levels, leaving us uh, further than ever from our, our targets, uh, long and short-term targets for greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, and as EK mentioned, uh, we have to achieve an average of 8% reduction to get on track for 2030, uh, which is something that you know has only really happened um, in the context of the massive reduction we saw from the pandemic in 2020. So uh, it's really challenging to see how we get on track for these targets, but there are some signs of hope. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is go over policy priorities at all three levels of government. Um, it's not an exhaustive list of every possible policy or program action. Uh, which I don't have time for, but just selected based on emissions trends that we see in the data and upcoming policy review cycles in some cases that make these particularly relevant uh, in the coming year. Um, so starting with uh, the municipal uh, set, uh, level of government, um, one of the most important priorities we see because of the rapid growth in the region is preserving and maintaining uh, green development standards. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the region's growing rapidly. We're expecting over a million new people across the GTHA by 2030. And, and that's a lot of new homes and buildings. Uh, it's like adding a major city to the region. So achieving deep reductions while accommodating, that's really tricky. And it's really important that new buildings be designed to be as low carbon as possible. Uh, green development standards are municipal design standards that require uh, low carbon and other sustainable design features as uh, as part of uh, the planning of new developments. And um, there has been some changes with Bill 23 at the provincial level. Uh, uh, the original bill would have uh, significantly curtailed municipal authorities for uh, implementing these green development standards. But we made some recommendations to the province to really amend the bill to prevent that. Uh, we were joined by over uh, 600 uh, individuals and stakeholders who signed on to our recommendation. Uh, while we didn't get the exact language we wanted in the final bill, uh, the province did make a series of amendments, which we think are sufficient uh, for municipalities to um, maintain and continue forward with their green development standards, such as the Toronto Green Standard. Uh, but of course, we have to deal with this uh, enormous amount of existing buildings and really make progress there as well. Uh, and so the next key step for cities is to develop similar performance standards for existing buildings, especially large buildings. Uh, this is something we've seen sweep across much of the US, uh, first in New York City, Boston, Washington, and many other cities now. And uh, in Canada, we've seen the city of Vancouver recently put these kind of standards in place. So the regulated, uh, emissions intensity based standards for existing buildings with with certain years that uh, compliance needs to be achieved by and helps to create that predictable downward trend in emissions. Uh, really critical for cities to look at this tool. We know the city of Toronto is actively uh, working on developing such a policy with our support and uh, we'll be uh, looking to work with other cities across the region uh, in a similar vein. Of course, we also need to address transportation at the municipal level, of course, building out um, both active transportation and public transit infrastructure is key. But cities also have a key role in supporting uh, the adoption of zero emissions vehicles. Um, and this can include through uh, parking policies and development policies, for example, requiring electric vehicle charging readiness and new development. Uh, 
also, uh, you know, supporting the, the rollout of public charging infrastructure. And in some cases where that is on municipal land, then being the party that, um, that uh, helps to create that charging infrastructure, for example, on street or, or at uh, municipal buildings. Um, and, uh, and then of course, within their own fleets, uh, cities have a key role to play in supporting electrification. Next slide, please. At the provincial level, there's a lot of key priorities as well. Uh, so first, we highlighted during the presentation the rapid pace of increase in electricity generation emissions and how the, those are expected to continue increasing uh, under the current forecast all the way up to 2040. Uh, and this will make achieving climate targets extremely difficult, both because of this additional uh, carbon pollution, but also that we're kind of relying on clean electricity to make other solutions like electric vehicles and heat pumps uh, as effective as possible. So uh, as soon as possible, putting a moratorium on the construction of new gas generation um, in, in Ontario. Uh, there's, there's about 1500 megawatts planned that the, that the province is proposing. We're hoping some of that can be, uh, or all of that could be uh, changed. Uh, but at whatever point in time, we need to stop building new natural gas plants if we're going to get in online for our climate targets and invest in the affordable and reliable electricity grid. We need to underpin electrification so through conservation, demand management, but also renewables and distributed energy resources. Uh, and part of that is getting uh, you know, increases in utility conservation programs, um, which is, are, are provincially regulated. So we saw a modest increase in the new natural gas uh, demand uh, management plan approved at the Ontario Energy Board recently. Uh, over the next three years, there'll be modest increases. But we'd like to see that ramping up much quicker in line with uh, provinces uh, made an Ontario environment plan, which uh, which re would require a much faster ramp up of um, of natural gas conservation. And also on the electricity side, we saw an, in an increase in the spring, uh, which was very welcome. But there's still a lot more cost effective potential for electricity conservation that will both reduce emissions and uh, avoid the need for new generation infrastructure. And then on transportation, uh, of course, funding for public transportation is a key provincial role. And we're starting to see some of that, uh, but also uh, funding for uh, zero emissions vehicle infrastructure. And ideally, we'd like to see uh, uh, sales rebates or incentives uh, to match the federal ones. Uh, we saw a welcome uh, you know, move from the province th this year to, to allocate 90 million for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. The first significant allocation from this government for that purpose um, since 2018. Uh, so we'd like to see more of that going forward as uh, getting the charging infrastructure in place is really key for adoption of electric vehicles. Next slide, please. And finally, at the federal level. Uh, so a key thing, a key role for the federal government is around this clean electricity uh, goal that we need to achieve. Uh, the federal government is working on something called the Clean Electricity Standard or Clean Electricity Regulation. And uh, that will is intended to require all uh, electricity systems across Canada to be uh, net zero by 2035. Uh, so we need to encourage the federal government to continue moving on that goal, to follow through on that promise, to make sure the regulation is stringent and, uh, and well thought out. And we'd like to see interim targets as well to make sure there's some progress towards those 2035 goals on the 2030 timeline which would be critical to achieving the federal government's climate targets as well. Um, the federal government also has a role on building codes. Uh, while, they, they, while provinces establish their own building codes, uh, the federal government maintains model building codes and has agreements in place with uh, the provinces for harmonization. Uh, so there's a key role here. And one of the concerns we have is the, that uh, the national model codes um, don't address uh, uh, carbon emissions and climate change. They focus only on energy and are fuel neutral. Uh, so we really need to modernize those and get a net zero emissions type code in place uh, with a plan to transition there. And uh, that, that uh, addresses carbon emissions directly, both operating carbon emissions would be key. And then in the longer term, uh, embodied emissions from construction material, as well as we need the code, the model codes to address uh, other net zero key components like uh, electric vehicle readiness, and uh, solar ready requirements to make sure that we are setting ourselves up for truly net zero buildings. And finally, I think a, a huge priority at the federal level is um, zero emissions vehicles. The federal government's also promised a zero emissions vehicle sales mandate that would require uh, 
100% of new light duty vehicles sold in Canada to be uh, zero emissions vehicles by 2035 with interim targets uh, before then. Uh, that's uh, really exciting. Uh, and the key thing is getting those regulations in place and making sure that they remain as stringent as the original vision and commitment from the federal government. And as well, uh, moving forward on uh, zero emissions vehicle sales mandates for uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles, which represent a growing share of transportation emissions in Canada. And this is really key uh, for a number of reasons. First, we need to get uh, more of these vehicles on the roads, replacing internal combustion engines. Uh, but also we're seeing um, it's very hard to get your hands on an electric vehicle in Ontario. And that's partly because uh, around the world, uh, sales and vehicles are being moved to jurisdictions that have uh, sales mandates or similar regulations in place. Uh, manufacturers are prioritizing those jurisdictions for shipping the electric vehicles they are producing. And so that's led to really long waiting lists in Ontario for an electric vehicle and uh, long waiting lists in many uh, Canadian provinces. Um, so a national sales ma mandate would help to uh, prevent that problem, ensure uh, equitable access to electric vehicles uh, across the country, and, uh, and send clear signals both to the, to the auto industry about uh, where we need the vehicle uh, stock to be going, but also um, to other key actors uh, at the provincial and municipal level uh, to get confidence in the amount of electric vehicle charging infrastructure we need, the investment we need from governments and the private sector. A sales mandate would really help to create clarity for that whole sector and make sure we're planning for uh, infrastructure, including generation infrastructure, to meet this uh, emerging trend of vehicle electrification. And next slide, please. Uh, and so that concludes the formal part of the presentation. And, um, but it's just the beginning of our discussion here today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Julie to introduce the Q&A and give some uh, instructions on how to uh, participate. Excellent, thank you so much, Brian and Katrina. Uh, reminder that we have a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. We had a few questions come in that were answered um, in the chat. And I'd like to start uh, first by inviting Miriam and EK back to the Q&A. Thank you so much. And um, I may unmute you to uh, ask your questions if you're comfortable with that, but I'll start with some of the questions that came in through the Zoom registration. Um, we asked folks what they were interested in discussing today and we got some questions related to um, innovation and industry. Um, one question we had, and uh, this one's for Brian. Um, what's the estimated increase in natural gas costs from carbon tax, excluding market impact? So if you look at um, $170 a ton, which is where carbon price is supposed to, uh, uh, is set to rise by 2030, that equates to about 34 cents per cubic meter. Um, and so for context, if you look uh, at the pre-pandemic prices of natural gas, it was about 34 cents at, at the retail level uh, for users. So compared to pre-pandemic natural gas prices, uh, the carbon tax is set to approximately double those by 2030. Of course, we're seeing many other factors impacting natural gas prices, uh, including uh, you know, current global factors such as the war in Ukraine, which have caused some, some spikes in prices as well. And, uh, and so on that basis, uh, carbon pricing may be only one of many factors that uh, might drive an upward trends in natural gas prices over the next decade. Great, and uh, this question comes in from uh, Jalesh, which is um, related to what you were just speaking about, Brian, with the EV supply chain issues. So consumers are waiting long periods of time to be able to purchase an EV. And this question is, um, what do you think is a bigger barrier um, ZET to ZEV adoption? Is it the lack of infrastructure or is it actually the car manufacturers? Well, Maybe both. <laughs> there's a role for both. Uh, I will say that a lot of the car manufacturers are ramping up uh, manufacturing of EV models, uh, but they've been late to the game, uh, you know, arguably should have foreseen this, this trend coming earlier and, and the pandemic has sort of disrupted their ability to adjust their whole supply chain. So 
I think immediately, yes, right now, the biggest barrier is the fact that for many vehicles, you've got, uh, you know, a six month or longer waiting list in, uh, in Ontario today. And that's quite a deterrent for uh, many uh, people looking to buy a vehicle that may not be prepared to wait that long. So that, that's a huge deterrent. But we know from surveys and other data that uh, charging uh, infrastructure is a key concern uh, of potential EV adopters. Um, and there's both acute concerns. So for people who don't have a place to charge at home, for example, they may live in a multi-residential building without charging, or they may not have a, a driveway or a garage at their single family home. And so for those people, it's almost a non-starter to adopt EVs until they have some charging infrastructure close to home. Uh, and then for other drivers, of course, they're concerned about the trips they make and uh, the limited uh, charging infrastructure along uh, those routes. So it's actually a, really a huge priority um, to get more charging infrastructure out there. And it's something that all levels of government have a immediate role in uh, and it can help to support. Uh, and particularly in this multi-residential building situation, because if you look at where trends are going, like we really need to see tens of thousands of EV chargers uh, going into multi-residential buildings uh, each year to get uh, that sector ready for the uh, vehicle, electric vehicle revolution. And um, we're, we're not quite seeing anything at that level yet, although there's strong interest in some of those buildings. So a key priority there. Great, and there were a couple of uh, questions in the Zoom also about infrastructure for EVs, which I think you just answered. So thanks for those who submitted those questions. Um, this question is about the energy system. Um, how can we accelerate adoption of innovation into the energy system? Again, this one came through the Zoom registration and it's for Brian. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, and there's no one solution. I think, uh, you know, a key thing to accelerate innovation is, is creating more predictability about where the system is going. Like if, if there was a, and that's one of the reasons I think the federal uh, clean electricity standard is important. Send it, it'll send once it's ready a strong signal to investors, to industry about where the grid needs to go and therefore the innovation and technology we need to see adopted to support that. Uh, but of course, there's also barriers to innovation at the provincial and local level. Um, there is an active con conversation at the Ontario Energy Board about the, you know, the role of different players and uh, distributed energy resources, uh, distributed renewables and storage, for example, and demand response. And we really need more clarity about what the role uh, of regulated entities, such as local distribution companies, is going to be, and what the role of the private sector was gonna, is going to be, and how they'll work together, and to create well-functioning markets or programs to support that. Uh, and some of these solutions are challenging to get through uh, broad sort of market procurement exercises uh, and needs you know, a bit more development of how we can realize that enormous potential. And then on the large scale infrastructure side, you know, we need to start really planning for the low carbon future, thinking about the enabling investments in transmission and distribution infrastructure, as well as um, making sure when we procure energy, we're, we're you know, creating a level playing field for innovative technologies or even just large scale renewables to make sure they can participate and drive us towards the most cost effective uh, energy solutions uh, that will meet our climate targets. Um, so yeah, I think that there's work there. The federal government will help to set the stage with its regulatory context, but we do need the province and the Ontario Energy Board to create clearer frameworks and regulations to support uh, these new innovations on the electricity side. So I have some questions for, for EK, but just while we're on the theme of the electricity system, um, and this question could be for, for anyone on the team, have we seen, and I don't think we've measured exactly for the um, upcoming proposed gas-fired new power plants, but have you seen any air quality health impacts? Um, have there been any studies or estimates done for the impacts of a ramp up of gas-fired power plants in Ontario? I'm not aware of any specific uh, studies looking at uh, the um, impact of proposed expansions of gas generation in Ontario right now. We certainly know that gas plants do contribute to air quality problems, um, along with other uses of fossil fuels, including, of course, transportation and, um, and, and distributed uses of gas for heating, uh, you know, being, uh, th those tend to be the larger sources because those are in cities uh, and at ground level, uh, whereas power generation is, is usually peripheral to cities and, and with a high stack. Uh, 
but it's certainly part of the overall contribution to air quality. And we know um, that, um, you know, overall air pollution from fossil fuel use uh, in Ontario is, uh, is a significant cause of mortality and morbidity. And there's actually growing studies around the world looking at this and, and finding that the impact of air pollution on, uh, on health is underreported and underappreciated. Okay, thank you. And, and related again to the electricity system, another question from Kim Parada. Thanks for that um, question, Kim. Um, does the federal government have the authority through the clean electricity regulations um, to prevent Ontario from establishing new gas plants? Um, so yes, absolutely. F the federal government um, has authority over uh, climate pollution uh, from industrial sites uh, and point sources, uh, which is how they're approaching uh, the electricity sector. And they've demonstrated that through existing regulation that requires the phase out of coal fired generation, uh, but on a 2030 timeline. And, um, and so that, that precedent is, is clearly there. Um, but I should say that the, the regulation as it's currently planned, uh, the clean electricity standard uh, wouldn't prohibit um, provinces from building uh, gas plants uh, in the interim. Unfortunately, as it's currently planned, what it would do is it, it would require them if they're built after 2025, which any new one in Ontario we think would be, uh, it would require them to either shut down in 2035 or uh, adopt uh, technologies such as carbon capture and storage or conversion to alternative fuels uh, such as renewable natural gas or potentially hydrogen. So I think the federal government had hoped that was enough to deter any new uh, natural gas fired generation investments. Uh, but we're seeing in Ontario that it's, uh, it doesn't appear to be enough. Uh, and in fact, uh, the province has agreed to um, a, a basically indemnify the, those who are bidding to build new natural gas plants. Uh, they're saying if, if you have to shut down uh, due to federal regulations uh, before the end of your contract, we will continue you know, paying you for electricity that you'll no longer be generating and absorb all the impact at the provincial level or the rate payer level. Um, and so that's a concern and that's the only way we're able to build gas plants uh, in the current context is if government, uh, the province takes on that risk or the rate payer does. Um, so we're hoping that um, some sort of solution can be found because really it's not making a lot of sense to invest in new natural gas generation infrastructure at this stage when the plants won't even be built so 2026, 27, and obviously, you know, should you, when you build something like that, you want it to have a 20 year life, but that's not compatible with, with our climate goals or federal regulations. Okay, thank you. Um, back to a question about the inventory. This came through in a few different ways, and I know it's been answered in the Q&A, but just thought, um, and Katrina, if you wouldn't mind speaking to scope three emissions, and how TAF works on scope three, how it factors into the inventory and our work. Sure, so um, right now the scope, the way that we're partly addressing scope three, and I say partly is because um, we're really only looking at the fugitive methane. Um, that is typically scope three, that's what we've already included in this year's um, inventory. Regarding other scope three, um, we do have plans to look at embodied um, uh, embodied energy and specifically the embodied energy of building materials and systems and how those um, impact, uh, um, especially new buildings where they're, you know, built better. And so the embodied carbon becomes a much bigger part of the sort of carbon life cycle. Um, so we'll be looking in the future how to incorporate that um, using some of the, um, you know, there's a lot of research that we've done and that others have done um, in the space. Um, regarding other scope three, we likely won't get to a point where we're including all of scope three emissions. Um, there's quite a bit of, um, th th there's quite a bit of, I guess, factors that are included in scope three. You have um, out-of-boundary transportation, um, um, wastewater. You also have um, food um, uh, that's moving um, in and out uh, through you know, our GTHA boundary. So we probably won't get to a point where we're including all of scope three emissions, but we're sort of chipping away in parts that we feel comfortable in including the data um, and um, we feel comfortable in the assumptions that we need to make in order to include the data. And um, also maybe a quick note, whenever we include, uh, um, let's say, a new 
like fugitive emissions, sort of a new component to our inventory, we always kind of back calculate what the impacts are for the previous years as well. So we can make um, you know, apples to apples comparison. Yeah, and just a re reminder that you can find TAF's fugitive emission and fugitive methane emissions guidelines on the TAF website on the publications page. Um, this question is also for for UEK. Um, could you speak to your um, Could you speak to your thoughts on EB alterations code? I'm not sure what EB stands for here, but I'm guessing you do existing um, buildings importance versus the suggested municipal EB. Oh, existing buildings. Got it. Um, um, existing buildings policy. Yeah, um, I would say that. I mean, uh, a lot of us at TAF hold the opinion of the that existing buildings and and looking at a code for existing buildings is is quite important. Um, we're going to have a fair number of existing buildings, uh, even buildings that are built right now that are going to be here in 2030 and 2050. Um, so really looking at, you know, uh, a standardized way of, of, of moving towards improving the performance of existing buildings is, 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 is quite important. Um, and whether we do that at, um, you know, a certain kind of stepwise fashion similar to new construction or whether we look at, you know, maybe certain certain requirements I would kickstart this um, type of code being enacted. Um, it's something that I think we're really uh, focused on, especially since um, with existing buildings, we're looking at this transition of moving uh, from natural gas-based heating um, to electricity and how that is done in a, um, you know, how that's done really in the right way. And without getting maybe too far into the buildings, um, um, uh, sort of field, you know, how building retrofits are enacted, what type of retrofits, how retrofits are grouped together is quite important. Um, so having um, definitely a guidelines and consensus around that um, can translate into um, a reduction in emissions. And regarding building efficiency and improving of building efficiency, that's something that we'll keep a look at um, in the future of inventory. We're starting, I think, to see small glimpses of that, um, but uh, hopefully, the, the, the industry will move uh, uh, you know, with an increased amount of existing uh, building retrofits and that will translate into the inventory. But that's something that we're definitely keeping an eye on in the future and looking to quantify. I could just follow on that from a policy perspective. Um, so I guess, and for those who might not be following, um, I think the question relates to like the, the, the difference between the fe proposed federal approach for regulating uh, retrofit related measures in existing buildings, which is their alterations to existing building code that they're working on, uh, which is supposed to be ready, I think, in 2025. And uh, what we propose and are working on uh, with some cities, which is uh, building performance standards at the local level. And um, the reason we think the building performance standards are kind of the most important approach um, right now is that the federal government's been clear that the alterations to existing building code is a kind of process, a, a regulation that will take that would take effect. First, provinces would have to adopt it, uh, and then it would take effect when uh, buildings apply for a permit for a renovation, and it would require whatever specific component within the building that they're renovating that requires a permit to do that renovation. Then bringing that up to a modern code level, so it is an important policy. But having reviewed like permit data on existing buildings in the region. It would take a, a really long time to have a significant impact on emissions because a lot of buildings, including the worst performing buildings, like don't regularly undertake uh, renovations that require such a permit or, or when they do, they would be doing those things anyways. You know, like if you're replacing the lighting system in a building entirely, you're going to go with modern LED lighting. Um, and so it, it's kind of not hugely impactful because, yeah, when people do those major projects that affect, that trigger building permit uh, requirements. They're usually uh, improving energy efficiency anyways, in line with current construction standards. Uh, building performance standards, on the other hand, as as looking at the model of Vancouver, New York, Boston, uh, they tend to apply uh, to all buildings based on a time trigger. So it says by this date, you need to be hitting these performance levels or there's some sort of uh, regulatory consequence. You know, in most of the existing cases, it's, uh, it's a fine or administrative penalty. And so it's a system that really encourages and, and sort of requires for compliance uh, all buildings that are captured by it, uh, typically large buildings, to move towards these performance targets and, and achieve them, whether they're uh, going through a renovation that requires a permit or not. And it, and it provides them flexibility on how to achieve it, uh, you know, what they want to do to achieve those reductions, because it's performance-based. 
and is about the whole building, not just a system being renovated. So I think these can be complementary tools, but uh, we see a lot more emission reduction potential from building performance standards than the alterations to existing building code as it's currently contemplated. And before we move on to the next topic, were there any other questions about uh, existing building performance standards? Um, you could raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, I also wanted to address one of the questions that came through Zoom, which was about the role of local distribution companies. Uh, the question was, what is Toronto Hydro's, uh, Toronto Hydro's position on net zero electrification potential and what step has been put in place to prepare? And um, rather than speak on behalf of Toronto Hydro, I'm just going to put into the chat um, Toronto Hydro's climate plan, which talks about their um, position on at zero electricity, so you can have a look at that. Um, I think that was it related to um, existing buildings. So I'm going to move on to a question from Jackson, um, back to the conversation about EVs. And this is a question that we get frequently. Uh, we also saw the federal government introduce um, a strategy on, on Friday related to um, mining minerals. So this question is um, for the quantification or, or Brian. Uh, teams, if the car manufacturers ramp up their production, how does it impact the global carbon emissions level related to extracting required materials that support batteries in EVs? Would anyone like to take a crack at I that? I can start and maybe my uh, my colleagues can, can jump in. I, I can't give you a quantitative answer to this. Uh, certainly, uh, yes, there are significant emissions associated with manufacturing electric vehicles, including uh, the 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 the, the batteries and other components. Uh, and, and it's important that those be addressed and reduced over time. We do see that, the, for example, battery production carbon emissions have been trending down per, uh, per, per unit of output. Uh, and, and hopefully that will continue and accelerate. I think the key thing, then there's confusion out there about this, which is why I want to speak to it, is that like often when people make this comparison, uh, if you see some comparisons which suggest battery electric vehicles are worse than ICE vehicles once you account for all this, those, those comparisons aren't uh, accurate. Uh, and I just wanna make that message clear. And a key thing is they're not doing an apples to apples comparison like between um, the full life cycle on both types of vehicles, right? Cause you have to understand that with an uh, ICE vehicle, the full life cycle emissions includes not just manufacturing the vehicle and burning fuel at the tailpipe, but also the massive emissions associated with fossil fuel extraction and refining and transportation. Uh, and once you take that into account, you see that like actually the advantage with battery electric vehicles is even larger than if you just look at the at the direct emissions. Uh, so it doesn't mean that we don't need to address the environmental impacts of, of electric vehicle manufacturing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's uh, that's a critical priority, especially for those jurisdictions that have uh, that those economic activities happening. But it uh, doesn't change the overall calculus that compared to a similar internal combustion engine vehicle, a battery electric vehicle is, is far superior from an emissions perspective. And maybe just to really highlight um, Brian's point here about the life cycle. And, and this is and EVs are not just are not the only example where you sometimes make comparisons of life cycle where you include part of the life cycle for one part of the comparison and, and different parts of the other. So it's very important when looking at those comparisons to really kind of dig down into the information and see what exactly are, are you know, apples to, is there an apples to apples comparison? Um, um, because sometimes numbers can very easily get skewed um, if you're only looking at part of the life cycle um, in one example. And uh, yeah, off, happens quite often. Great, and um, Brian, I see you wanted to answer the question from Hausen about, um, there's been a lot of research showing Oil and gas companies have for decades been holding back on any climate action against fossil fuels. Do you have any comments about the role of companies like Enbridge, which provides the lion's share of gas to both Ontario gas plants and the gas for GTHA homes? Yeah, what I wanted to pick up on with that question. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's kind of surprising to a lot of people that uh, the main vehicle provincially for conserving natural gas in homes and buildings is incentive programs administered by Enbridge, the natural gas utility. You know, and obviously there's an apparent conflict of interest there, right, with a utility trying to encourage customers to use less of its own product. Um, and that has been a problem in many jurisdictions. Uh, and of course, those programs exist because they're regulated utilities, they're required to run the programs, and they're compensated for running the programs. Uh, 
but still there is uh, some sort of um, conflicts of interest there, right? And I want to highlight that there's been some encouraging developments at the Ontario Energy Board about that uh, with the new natural gas conservation uh, plan that was approved for Enbridge for the next three years, just uh, last month, I believe. And uh, what was encouraging to me there was that the OEB, uh, there's been a longstanding issue where um, Enbridge has held that um, to participate in those programs, you have to be um, a, a, an Enbridge cu customer both before and after the re renovation. Uh, so it's kind of really disincentivized full fuel switching. Uh, and, and this is particularly problematic, for example, in new construction where, uh, you know, they're sort of saying you have to plan around at least uh, it being a natural gas, partly heated building to participate in incentives for energy efficient new construction. So the Ontario Energy Board actually uh, clearly uh, decided to put a stop to that with a new plan. They said uh, all of these programs have to be available to customers, even if they're completely transitioning off of natural gas for, uh, for heating, whether that's in new construction or existing buildings. Uh, there can't be a requirement to stay on natural gas in any way. You, you have to have that option to be incentivized for your conservation, even if you're completely disconnecting from the gas grid. So I think that's a really positive development. Um, and of course, it doesn't solve all the issues with the sort of conflicts of interest and in having uh, utilities uh, run their own conservation programs. But it certainly goes a long way to creating some clear ground rules that will protect consumers. Great. And um, I love this question from Jalesh. And uh, his question is, what's the best way for an average Torontonian to get involved in pushing our city's climate agenda forward? And I would add to that question, um, how do you all see the role of the inventory? How can individuals and organizations use the inventory to advocate for strong climate policies? I'll take a first crack at that, I guess. Um, so I think we, we would encourage all users of the inventory to use it in their advocacy for climate policies. We, of course, include in the inventory uh, some of our analysis of climate policy priorities, which I presented today. Um, and, and we encourage and have seen in the past people citing our inventory uh, when they write submissions to their, you know, to government or to their elected officials uh, asking for stronger climate policy. They will they'll often cite our inventory to, to support either the solution they're promoting or the, the need for action given the emissions trend. And we really encourage that. Um, and I think it does help uh, make uh, advocacy more impactful. Uh, and of course, um, you know, organizations and governments can use that data directly and sort of uh, figuring out where their priorities should be. Uh, for average citizens, of course, uh, you know, there, there's some clear priorities. Your biggest sources of emissions are, are heating your your home if you, uh, if you have your own single family home. Um, and then, uh, and then your transportation choices. Uh, typically, those are the two largest. So, looking at you know energy efficiency in your home, especially fuel switching to away from natural gas, and um, reducing you know internal combustion vehicle use, uh, whether through active transportation and public transit, or uh, adopting an electric vehicle or a combination. Um, but yeah, I'll, Ek, anything to add on that? I would say the. Um... Um, you know, there's, there's definitely a few things you can do on the organizational level versus the, 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 the kind of personal level, um, sort of in all our lives. I would highlight also that um, with this year's inventory, we have the full life cycle of natural gas in there through the fugitive methane, um, which I think really paints a clearer picture of the actual, the true impacts of, 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 of natural gas. So I think that, you know, is an important um, policy tool. We can't make the right policies unless we know the full picture and the full information and the full impacts of, of the types of fuels and um, energy sources that we use. So um, I would really highlight that, uh, and especially this year, um, as an important uh, part because it, it makes a difference. I, I showed that one graph where it's about 10 to 15% increase on the building side. If you actually include the, looking at the building sector specifically, that translates to almost a 30% increase just because of the amount of natural gas that buildings use. So it's quite, um, uh, it, it's quite significant looking at what actually the fuel, the, the full picture is. Uh, and that's really what we, that's what's actually being emitted in the atmosphere. Great, thanks, EK. And um, one more question in the Q&A, and this is to follow uh, what you were talking about earlier, Brian, about uh, the role of oil and gas. Um, is there a conflict of interest uh, with Enbridge in charge of the federal green homes program in Ontario? Would you like to respond to that? Right. 
That's a great question. So, and for those who don't know, um, there's been for for a little over a year now, I guess, um, a federal program, the Greener Homes Program, which provides rebates of up to five thousand dollars for home energy retrofits. And uh, the decision was just made uh, that uh, starting in January, um, that program in Ontario will switch from being administered by the federal government to being administered by Enbridge. And Enbridge will be providing uh, matching incentives, uh, uh, sort of topping up the incentive provided by the federal government and handling uh, sort of applications and payments. And so that created a lot of concern, of course, because of what I mentioned previously about uh, some of the historic issues with uh, customers being unable to participate in Enbridge conservation programs if they were fully uh, uh, moving off of uh, the natural gas uh, grid, uh, fully fuel switching, for example, the heat pumps. So the OEB was quite clear when they approved that, that uh, that the, that has to be eligible for, for, for all customers, even if they're completely going off of natural gas with the renovation. And that uh, they actually really actually specifically required uh, specific amounts of dollars for Enbridge to leverage uh, federal incentives for heat pumps in uh, in homes. And so I think that goes a long way to resolving the conflict of interest. Of course, we'll have to see how the program rolls forward. I know many people remain concerned about this change, uh, and so you know I'll, I'll reserve judgment until we see how that uh, rolls forward. Uh, but I think at least the OEB has been clear on their expectations for supporting that full fuel switching in the program. And I think that's sort of a key uh, key development that was encouraging. Are there any final thoughts from the presenters? Um, well, I would really like to thank uh, everyone for joining us today for supporting this work, participating in the webinar and uh, promoting lessons that you learned here today. As usual, we're very eager to collaborate and grateful to have your feedback from today or on the inventory itself. We did have a very new and fresh format of the inventory this year. So really interested to hear whether this um, new format is useful for you. Uh, if you have feedback, please do let us know. We'll send you a copy of the slide presentation and the webinar recording, feel free to share it and to be the first to hear about upcoming research and other perspectives, do subscribe to taf.ca. We send out a monthly newsletter with hopefully helpful information to um, support your work. I wanna thank the presenters for joining me today as well and those who are answering questions in the chat. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your Monday. Bye everyone. <laughs>